Bree, Halloween's over. You know that it's April, right? I have a problem. Okay, then. Well, uh, please forgive the unfamiliar surroundings. Uh, due to a freak megabuster accident, the office is still under repairs. You clicked on the video, you know why you're here. Castlevania Season 2. With the first season of Castlevania being a smash hit, a second season was almost inevitable. In fact, the series was confirmed for a second season the day the first season was launched. With double the episodes of the prior entry, meaning a whole eight instead of just four, Season 2 fleshes out the story even more by expanding not only our roster by a significant margin, but also by diving into the motives and backstories of the most important characters. So let's not waste any more time, let's jump right in. This is Castlevania Season 2. Our second season opens up with a flashback sequence showing Dracula's wife, Lisa, giving medicine to the old woman who left flowers at her burnt house last season. It's a powder mixed with some strawberry wine. A powder? You sound like the old wise woman we used to have. The powder turned out to be her dried foot skin. My god, I'm amazed any of you are still alive. As the old woman takes the medicine and prepares to leave, it turns out the bishop and his men were waiting outside. You know what to look for? Here, your eminence. Satan's tools. Make fire, clean it out. Take it to the cathedral at Targovista. There shall be an inquisition. After she's interned, you may take some arms to she who was the wise woman of this village. So it was the footskin lady who tattled on her to the bishop? I guess being a doctor's competitive field. You know what happens next. They burn down the house and burn her at the stake. Now, here's where the story takes a slight detour from Castlevania 3 and takes influence from Curse of Darkness, as we're introduced to two new characters, Hector and Isaac, in addition to the animated series exclusive characters, Dracula's Vampire Generals. Hector, Isaac, present me with plans for our next steps today. The only two humans in your inner court, and they are the ones who will plan our next attack. The only two generals in my court who are not driven by thirst. Hey, where are you two going? We're going to talk to him. Why would he want to talk to you rather than me? Godbrand, you've never met anything you didn't immediately kill, fuck, or make a boat out of. Figured. I like boats. I'm a fucking Viking! Hello? Did somebody say boat? Boat? No, no wait! Hector and Isaac meet with Dracula, and we get an exposition dump for why he asked for their help. The Vampire Generals considered humans to be mere livestock, just grazing animals to be slaughtered. But Dracula truly hates humanity, as do his two human conspirators. We're then treated to an audio flashback to give us a character for Hector. I never wanted you, Hector. You sickened me. Do you understand? The moment you came out of me, I knew you were wrong. Alchemy is for money and power, boy. Money and power and buying our safety are all that matters. Hector, unlock this door at once! Are you burning something out there? I understand completely. Back in Gracia, the townsfolk are finishing their cleanup from the battle, both attending to their own dead and the dead night creatures. The speaker tribe departs, leaving Sypho with Trevor and Alucard, but she's already having second thoughts. They're heading into who knows what danger, and I'm standing here sad and angry because they're together, and I'm alone. This is where you're supposed to tell me that I'm not alone, Belmont. You are really not very good at this. I'm sorry, but we have a thing to do now. All I can do is try and make sure it doesn't get you killed. So you can see your family again. That's your encouraging talk? Or you get killed and they get eaten in the forest, so none of you have to be sad. How's that? I was right about you the first time, you know? You are rude. I've been called worse. 
I'm just getting started. Alucard is off by himself, brooding like the emo boy that he is. Little Cesar, what are you doing? Not really doing much, Hector. It's dead. We make life from death here. Hector and Isaac are what are known as Double Forge Masters. Given the evidence from the flashback earlier, I'm going to assume that it's some form of alchemy in this version. Basically, they can take dead bodies and resurrect them as monsters inhabited by a soul from the afterlife with complete loyalty to the one who revived them. The last of the dead from Gracia? He's moving the castle again. I'm pretty sure that's the save point from Symphony of the Night. The castle lands elsewhere, and we return to our main trio. I want to go home. The old Belmont estate, the Belmont Hall. Our family library and trove. The collecting knowledge and material of generations of Belmonts who fought the creatures of the night. That sounds interesting. Fortunate indeed, then, that I chose not to kill you and eat you, Belmont. And that I decided against gutting you, flaying you, and turning you into shoes, Alucard. I will find us a covered wagon and horses if you two can manage not to kill each other while I'm gone. Oh, please. We're not children. He shouldn't die. Yes, fuck you. Like every good romance, theirs is founded on a healthy balance of insults and profanity. Our heroes depart Gratiot and Dracula assembles the War Council, but the generals are not happy with the current plans. I said, cease! And here comes a new character that is clearly going to be more important than the rest of the generals. I am Carmilla. I am come from Fasteria to join the War Council. Anybody who knows anything about Castlevania, or just vampire lore in general, could see that Carmilla is going to be a major player. And this representation of her is spot on. Backstabbing, seductive, and scheming, all with a commanding personality and an EX rank charisma stat. Why was this new wife of yours never turned? I will speak with you alone. Trevor and company make camp for the night. Despite Dracula's genocidal plan, Alucard reveres his father as the scholar and man of science that he once was. Do you still not understand the enormity of what we're doing? He's gone mad, and from that, there is no recovering him. When he writes plans, I've seen them. Ideas for darkening clouds and making them as permanent in the air as the frost of the north. Imagine it. A world without humans, under endless invented night. Did you hear that? Animals humming in the undergrowth. Wait, no. No further. Our first fight sequence of the season, and it does not disappoint. This battle shows us that Dracula's demons aren't just mindless monsters, but that they are intelligent and tactical, which makes them all the more dangerous. We also start to realize that Trevor is a bit underpowered when compared to Sypha and Alucard. Sypha's sorcery is truly awe-inspiring, and Alucard has his vampire abilities, but Trevor is just a normal human being, though he manages to hold his own well enough through sheer guts and skill. Only one demon survived the battle, and he turns tail and runs. Nobody's going to our guest tonight. We then return to Dracula's castle and find Isaac whipping himself while having flashbacks about being whipped. The next part is pretty heavy, so I think I'll just let the dialogue speak for itself. I found you dying on the street. I gave you a home and fed you, and all you were supposed to do was work quietly and watch my back, not go behind my back and fuck around with the tools of my trade. What did you think you were gonna learn? How? How to help you. Why? Because I love you. Well, I love you too. <laughs> That's why I do this. This is how I love you. This is how I teach you. No, no such thing as love in this world. So here's where we get one of the biggest changes between the game and anime series so far. In Curse of Darkness, Isaac was simply loyal to Dracula and he comes across as your typical power-hungry madman who just wants to watch the world burn. 
While that is a popular character archetype, it's been so overused in the past several years that I think it's gotten a little bit stale. In this version, we're actually given a logical reason as to why a human would side with Dracula when he's put out a hit on the entire human race. If humanity treats each other like this, even to the point of punishing others for showing gratitude, then I can understand why someone in Isaac's position would want to wipe out his entire species. This is also backed up by one of Dracula's lines from earlier. You can't hate livestock. They are simply what they are. Grazing animals to be slaughtered. But you two are different. You understand that humans think, and scheme, and betray. You understand why they all must die. Yes, this is the work we were born for. So we trade the Agent of Chaos archetype for the Humans Are Corrupt archetype. While it's not the most original, it fits more well for the theme that they've established so far. He died 20 yards from our door. Imagine, so horribly injured, and so determined to come back to us. And crapping out a minute before it managed it. Despite Gobrand's less than compassionate reaction, Isaac takes pity on the dead night creature and uses his powers to resurrect it. Perhaps this is all loyalty buys. Death on your master's floor. Perhaps that's all that awaits me too. But you didn't mind. You came home regardless. The lesson here is that I shouldn't care either. Once his work is done, Isaac returns to the War Hall as the generals debate the benefits of attacking Argesh versus Brela. Argesh has no real importance. You should have counseled an attack on Brela. If you were serious about serving Arnold's war, you would have seen that taking the biggest river port town in the region was important. Any city built over running water is a place that we, as vampires, should approach carefully. Death by running water hasn't happened in many centuries. I've been told that vampires couldn't cross running water. I've been on boat, I've had baths. When? Isaac suggests that since Argesh is close to Grishid, the raiding party must have been attacked by Alucard and a Belmont, since the last known location of the two was at Grishid. If there is a Belmont left alive, then should we not observe the ancestral Belmont home? Godbrand apparently doesn't realize the threat that the Belmont clan poses, as Carmilla politely informs him of the Belmont legacy of monster hunting. This is your war council, my lord? The next episode starts with a flashback sequence. We find a young Hector looking rather forlorn, probably because nobody complimented him on his Goku Black cosplay. He then comes across a dead dog, and we see him perform his devil forging to bring it back to life. Flash forward to present, and Hector successfully turns a corpse into a monster. A new night creature. Amazing. Hector then reminisces on how he and Dracula met, and how he was recruited into the war effort. I need an army. The dead must rise, and creatures of the night must be called into their corpses. The humans you renounced, they killed my wife. Is this... genocide, Dracula? If it is, then Dracula's in for a really tough final boss fight. Hector states that, despite his hatred for humans, he doesn't want them to go extinct, but rather to be culled and made into livestock, as long as the conditions were, in his words, merciful. After the story is over, Carmilla turns her attention to the pile of corpses in the room, and the camera zooms in on the bishop. We'll have to wait to find out. Our story finally returns to the heroes as they arrive at the Belmont home. How old were you when your family home was taken? Maybe twelve. Who remembers that sort of thing? Twelve. Is there a point to these questions? I'm disturbed to find that I have more of a childhood than you did. And your dad's fucking Dracula. No, but Lisa was. Hello. Well, well. Naughty Belmont's hunting all the terrible things of the forest, but sitting on a magic door opened by a coven language. 
I didn't know it was a fucking magic door. Doesn't make us black magicians. But you know that the word Telok means of death, right? Shut up. It's the magical door of death, Belmont. Are you coming or what? The trio descends into the hold and we get a small history lesson on the Belmont heritage. Belmont isn't even a Wallachian name. That just dawned on me. No. The family's originally from the Kingdom of France. But we moved out of there a few hundred years ago. Moved or chased? Moved. Thank you very much. With people behind you waving pitchforks and torches. Saifa's expression is priceless. Is it organized? Is there a way to find things? I imagine one sacrifices a chicken and defines the location of the book you want from the intestines. Maybe Belmont has a crystal ball in here you could ask. There's an index on the lectern at the bottom. What was your Leon Belmont doing in Wallachia? Hunting Dracula. Another nod to Lament of Innocence, as Leon was the first Belmont to do battle with Dracula. Trevor then spots a treasure chest, and upon opening it, he finds his family's greatest heirloom. It's the Morning Star. If you kill all the humans, what are we gonna eat? Pig blood gives me the shit. I'm sorry, but there it is. I will not be questioned by you. I have told you how it will be. The humans will die. You will be taken care of. Get out before I slit you up the middle and bite out your heart. No complaints are being accepted at this time. Godbrand runs into Carmilla in the hallway and he tells her the news. He's gonna kill all the humans and leave us without any livestock. I still wouldn't want to try him in a straight fight, but I have a strong suspicion he hasn't fed in a while. Why would Dracula of all people go without blood? His wife's dead and he wants to join her. And he wants to take all of us with him. We're all gonna die! All of us! You stupid bastard. After kicking Godbrand down a long flight of stairs, Carmilla makes perfectly clear her intentions to overthrow Dracula as she did with her first master, saying that she will not be controlled by cruel, dying old men ever again. Never again. your eyes, man! Bring me blood and beer! Oh, no, no, that, that's not fair. Damn it all, that bloody woman is right. Some things must be done. While the sense of betrayal grows stronger in Dracula's court, Trevor finds a magic mirror, and Alucard explains that it can be used to see faraway places if they were to recarve the runes. You have the most fascinating family junkyard, Belmont. You're a cockwart, Alicard. Stop it! You are an adult. You do not have to rise to his every barb. He's pissing me off like it's his job, Cypher. Grow up, Trevor. What is your name, Trevor, anyway? Trevor then tells Cypher the origin of his name, as it doesn't sound Wallachian either. His name was taken from one of Leon Belmont's old friends, who was named Trefor, spelled with an F. Tref... Treffy? Oh my god, man. You are Treffy now. Don't. <laughs> Should this war be prosecuted by a confused man? You're human, Hector. But your loyalty counts for nothing. Does that sound sane to you? I just want to do my work, Camilla. I love my work. You just have to answer one question for me. Are you prepared to abandon Dracula to win the war? The castle must land at Brela, Hector. My own forces will take the castle and unseat Dracula, saving your life. Your forces alone may not be enough. They may not be. Which is why you must do something for me. More foreshadowing with the bishop's corpse, and then we flash back to when Dracula inducted Isaac into his army. You have need of my work. Invite me across your threshold, Isaac. The only person in the world who ever lifted a hand to protect me from anything, and he was not a human. I will be loyal to the end, and beyond. Let us begin. 
So now we have a bit more context as to why Isaac is so loyal to Dracula. Unfortunately, he's the only one. Godbrand and the other generals decide to go on a feeding raid on a nearby town, being dissatisfied with the animal blood they've been given. We take a small detour to visit Dracula's study, where he's using his own magic mirror. He throws a piece of cloth through it and is teleported into a forest, but this doesn't really go anywhere for now. Dracula then goes to visit Isaac, expressing concerns that the other generals may not actually be loyal to him. Meanwhile, Godbrand and the others arrive in the town and begin the massacre. I think the vampire general with the coolest design is the one that looks Japanese. She can transform into a cloud of mist, and she reminds me of the Fire Nation from Avatar. Back at the Belmont house, Sypha is feeling lonely, so Trevor tries to comfort her. She expresses that Alucard is hard to talk to, even though he's intelligent and witty. But it's like he's a cold spot in the room. It's not like your sadness. But I can shout at you or tease you and get a reaction that lets me know you're still in there. His sadness is like an icy web. It's bottomless. The two of them fall asleep as Godbrand goes to visit Isaac again, trying to recruit him into the rebellion. It may be time for the old man to sit in his study. Godbrand, no. And let the rest of us take care of this for him. Godbrand, stop! Set up a livestock pens and pursue the war properly without him. You're asking to die here! You would betray Dracula. It's not betraying. Unless the old man decides to be difficult about it. Okay, you're just stupid. It was nice knowing you, Godbrand. Predictably, Isaac is having none of this and decides to execute the traitor. As the new day starts, our heroes are hard at work trying to find something to stop Dracula. Alucard and Cypher can read the ancient books, but Trevor can't, so he's busy trying to find some new weapons to use. Interesting. I, I see threads of Chaldaic in it. You're rather well read yourself. I had entirely different books under my childhood bed. My father was a polymath, my mother was a doctor. I grew up very fast. What does that mean? I'm being literal. I aged very quickly. That may explain something. What? Perhaps you're just an angry teenager in an adult's body. <laughs> Is this where we kiss like Benedictine monks from different monasteries? I don't think I've ever heard you try to tell a joke before. You still haven't. It will please Camilla, so I distrust it. But it would get the war room pointed in the same direction. I imagine it would even make Godbrand smile. <laughs> yeah, well, don't talk me out of it. Of course, Carmilla is pulling all the strings behind the scenes. Isaac goes to present this united front to Dracula and the Vampire Lord agrees. The War Room will speak to you and Hector in one voice. And at the end of the day, you don't care. I'm tired, Isaac. There was a time that I would relish the details. Dracula then recounts how he used to enjoy terrorizing humans personally, but only those who deserved it. He mentions that a group of merchants had disrespected him, and he spent days planning his attack on the town before following through with it. An interesting contrast here, as Dracula states, at the time, he only felt it necessary to go after the merchants themselves and not the rest of the town. Whereas with the current war, every human, at least in Wallachia, is on his hit list. But those times are long gone. Carmilla and Hector arrive, asking Dracula to go to Brela, and he agrees. But things are never so simple. Now I ensure my forces will be in place. Then we inform the War Council and convince them that this was their plan all along. I am in control, Hector. You are? Yes. He could have done it. You could have done it. Any of the generals could have done it. But I had to. You're hip deep in this now, puppy. And the only way out is forward. Back at the Belmont Hold, Cypher comes across something useful. Trevor! What? I have something! Uh, when I say what, that doesn't mean I would like to ask even more questions. Sounds like me during high school. I you're the most annoying. Just stop! I can finish the final clauses of it myself. It's all based on adamical structures. You keep saying that word. Adamic is the original human language, the one that was split into all other languages at the Tower of Babel by God, to prevent human cooperation. Is that how you understand that story? Oh yes, the speakers are the enemy of God, 
We live in cooperation and hide our stories inside ourselves so we cannot strike them down in jealousy. A sentiment that most people have felt at some point, but as Alucard illuminates... That's probably not God. <laughs> Trevor instructs Alucard to get the distance mirror working and for Sypha to complete the locking spell while he stalls the monsters for as long as he can. <sighs> demons break through the magic door and head downward. Alucard swats the castle in the mirror, but Dracula's preparing to move it. Rayla. Just to keep the peace between squabbling creatures who will starve and die before the end of the year anyway. Well, can you blame him? The castle teleports to Brayla, and Dracula's army disembarks as Trevor meets the night creatures on their way down. Using Leon Belmont's longsword, Trevor attacks this behemoth and manages to slay it with just a little bit of challenge. Bless the river, Bishop. Make the water holy. Um, I don't think that holy powers extend to devil forged monsters. Additionally, I've never seen a body of water that big become holy water before. A cool concept, but I'm gonna call BS on this one. Oh, and the bishop is incinerated too. Trevor continues his battle with the Night Ward. Uh, probably just as well I didn't get to play with the whip when I was a kid. And this spear wielding demon says you don't get to play with it now. Not having time to retrieve the Morningstar, all Trevor has is this stick to fight against this harpy monster, who I'm pretty sure is a reference to the Crow Witch Malfast from the Lords of Shadow game. It's also defeated in the same way. Remove the mask to kill it quicker. You're an evil looking bastard, aren't you? Well, I'm armed with a... a stick. Hmm? So, I'll understand if you want to run away now. And because Hector's a little bit slow, he's just now seeing Carmilla's true colors. You're coming with me. Why? You can't go back to the castle now. You betrayed the old man. Get across the bridge. You're mine now, Forge Master. You have nothing left but me. Spoiler warning, just wait till season three. Hector takes one last look at the castle before following orders. She just finishes writing the spell that someone else started? Who does she think she is? Twilight Sparkle? We are betrayed at Brela. Camilla has made her move. Then we go downstairs, Isaac. Nobody takes my castle from me. Nobody except Sypha. It's fighting me! It's like I'm pulling against an anchor! And a water wheel! All at once. Trevor kills the last monster, and in quite an impressive display, Sypha overcomes the magic engine of the castle and forces it to move. Do as you're told. As the castle resists, the thrashing causes the holy river to flood the lobby, and most of the vampires are killed in the process. What the fuck just happened? I did it. Where did you land the castle, Sypha? Oh. Hmm. Yes, I landed it on the surface, right above this underground space that's probably only held up by wood and dirt. Let's go. The doors to Dracula's castle open as the holy water spills out, and the moon turns a blood red, as do Dracula's eyes. And that is one of the coolest shots in the series so far. Seeing that the stairs are smashed, Sypha graciously provides an elevator for them. This moment is dragged out for a little while, but that's not a bad thing. He gives our trio time to have one last calm moment before the epic showdown. Trevor observes a portrait of his ancestor, Leon, as Alucard's pep talk from earlier likely rings true in his mind. Come on, Belmont. Time to choose. You're either the last son of a warrior dynasty or a lucky drunk. Which is it? I 
didn't want to leave it in there to melt and ruin all your beautiful books. Alakan, are you ready for this? No, but let's put an end to this anyway. The battle inside the castle lobby comes to a halt the instant our heroes arrive. And... What's that I hear playing in the background? It's Bloody Tears from Castlevania 2! I terrify them. Cypher disorients them. Alucard goes over the top and we support him. Yes! Begin. All the vampires join forces to attack Trevor and company, despite Carmilla's army trying to dethrone Dracula. This fight is definitely more fun than Trevor vs. Alucard because of how much is going on, but the amount of action is also just slightly distracting and not quite as engaging as the one-on-one. -on -one. In the previous fight, you could track both of them at your own pace, but in this fight, there's so much going on you'll need to rewatch it a few times to take everything in. Definitely not. Now, on to the fight itself. As Trevor makes good use of his new whip, Cypher plays support again by throwing up walls of fire and again using holy water ice. More like a Dark Souls boss. Even with my minor criticism of too much going on, I still think this fight is one of the greatest moments in the series so far. The music, the scale, the choreography, especially when it comes to Cypher. Just watch this moment. And this moment looks particularly painful. Not much, apparently. Yeah, Dracula's great generals don't really seem to be able to do much here. He spots Trevor and his friends, and they retreat into Dracula's study. Behind me, Dracula. They will not reach you while I live. You would give your mortal life to preserve my immortal life? I choose my death, as I chose my life. Then I regret only that I have taken a choice for you. Dracula pulls a Doctor Strange and tosses Isaac through his magic mirror, landing him in the desert. No! Dracula! Your war is over. You couldn't stop me before. I was alone before. You know how every good action story, be it an anime or a movie, always has that one moment? The instant that you fully grasp the magnitude of the situation? Well, here's the first one. And he doesn't even acknowledge that Trevor is punching him in the face! You must be the Belmont. This was the second moment of clarity. Remember how just moments ago, our trio tore Dracula's army to shreds with Cypher incinerating them and Alucard slashing them to ribbons? But the biggest moment has to be right here. This is the moment when you piss your pants and run away screaming. Dracula just tanked a well-wound-up hit from Trevor's new magic whip that makes things explode. It even made him explode, but all it did was piss him off. I am Vlad Dracula Tepesh, and I have had enough! I would say that this is about as anime as the series has gotten so far, with the flying and the punching, moving faster than the eye can track, etc. It's not quite DBZ levels of absurd, however. One thing that I need to make note of is that whenever the action gets a little too fast-paced, there always seems to be a few frames of animation missing. This moment right here, where Alucard tear is blowing in the wind, is the best example that I can show. That said, I think it actually adds to the atmosphere, and it may have been more of an artistic choice rather than a technical error. If you think about it, in a fight as big as this, your adrenaline is pumping and everything seems to be more fluid anyway, so you don't need things to be so detailed that it takes you out of the moment. Reference our comments earlier on the battle in the lobby. So, while after the second or third watch, it is a little distracting, during the first viewing, the few drop frames are barely noticeable. It's your home. My boy. 
I'm killing my boy. Please. I'm killing our boy. Your greatest gift to me. And I'm killing him. I must already be dead. Without another word, Alucard fulfills his duty and stakes his father. As Dracula begins to fade away, his skeleton reaches out for Alucard, seemingly wanting to embrace his son just one last time. Sypha burns Dracula's corpse to ashes, leaving behind only his wedding ring. I... killed my father. You've saved countless lives, but it's alright to mourn the man too. He died a long time ago. Or is it? We still have another episode this season. Most of it is just the characters taking in the aftermath of the situation. Alucard, Trevor, and Sypha explore the castle a bit. We really must have your house, didn't we? Less damage than I would have thought. The engine room that moves the castle. I cannot imagine how that worked. Well, it doesn't work anymore. You melted it. I didn't melt anything. If I leave the castle here, be nothing but a grave to be robbed. So, let it be my grave. No. No? We can't move this thing. Cypher broke it. I did not. You kind of did. I do not break things. So, we agreed she broke it. Oh, yes. Right on top of the Belmont Hold. Behold, you sulky, half-vampire bastard. I bequeath you the Belmont Hold. You're giving me your home. Protect it. Make something out of it. Something better than a pile of ruins and a symbol of terror. Well, that was sweet. Now for something bitter. We rejoin Isaac in the desert, taking a drink from an oasis. He's approached by a team of bandits who have apparently decided that they're tired of living because they immediately start making threats. Put a rope around it. Drag it behind us. Perhaps we can sell it at the next town. Unless we get hungry between now and then, I suppose. Is that really the best you have? You don't deserve my best. You? Are simply meat. I'm not human. Oh, I'm sure you're human. I simply don't care. Me neither. And, in sweet irony, he devil forges all of them into night creatures and drags the leader by rope, while Isaac and the others get horses. Where will you go? I think I will return to Styria. What else is there? Do you think Dracula lives? No. We have viewed the castle with mirrors. Don't worry. We'll look after you. Camilla, what are you doing? I need a horde as Dracula had. And you are a forge master. You will create the horde for me. Go to hell. <laughs> My pet forge master. So, like the bandit in the desert, Hector is forced to walk behind while the others get horses. It's going to be a long walk back to Styria. Fuck you. A true bromance. But despite the demeanor that Alucard put on, it's just a facade. Back in the castle, he's already seen the ghosts of his father and his mother. But they're nothing more than memories. And that's where Season 2 leaves off. Dracula's defeated, Cromilla is set up as the next big villain, and Isaac is off building his army to finish what Dracula started. All I can say is, this season did not disappoint. It is a little bit slower paced than the previous season, but they had twice as many episodes to fill. The action sequences were fewer and further between, but they made up for this by having the fight scenes be even more epic than last time and giving us plenty of development for all the relevant characters. And at the end, all four parties are preparing for the future. Trevor and Sypha have nice chemistry, Alucard no longer has to live in his father's shadow, Carmilla stole the spotlight, and Isaac is easily the most interesting character introduced this season.
This was a phenomenal follow-up to the first season, and we're all excited to see what's in store for the future. But unfortunately, we'll have to wait for season three to come out of home media before we can review it. But in the meantime, I gotta go pay Rio back for dropping that boat on me. <laughs> you gotta be kidding me! You realize that half your recording equipment was still in me, right? <laughs>